AP 120, Chapter 10, Topics, General Senses. This includes touch. All right, so our senses. Basically, there are these things called sensations. And a sensation is when we become aware of a change in our external or internal environment. This may be conscious awareness of it or even subconscious. So the body's aware even if we're not. So we have the stimulus, something that is causing the change. So for instance, touching the sharp point of a cactus would be that change. Then we need a sensory receptor. That is something that detects the change and then can initiate a nerve impulse toward the central nervous system. Uh, the receptor then often makes contact with the sensory neuron that completely carries that sensation to the central nervous system and eventually the brain all information is processed and then the brain receives and integrates that information deciding on what response if any is needed so touching the cactus the response is probably to pull away so to stop the uh, injury and it's worth noting that the sensory receptor and sensory neurons sometimes are the same thing all right classifications of sensations we have the general sensations these are found all throughout our body. They include uh, the somatic senses or cutaneous senses. These are the ones associated with the skin and also with muscles. So tactile or touch, thermal, being aware of something's hot or cold, pain, it's everywhere. Uh, proprioceptive, relating to muscles. And then visceral senses. Visceral senses have to do with our internal organs. So it could be the pressure, say, a blood vessels under, how much stretch uh, the intestines is experiencing, um, the presence or absence of chemicals in the bloodstream, and our body temperature, hunger and nausea all fall under that uh, visceral category. And then there's the special senses. And these are localized to the head. Structures that detect them are in the head, and they include smell, hear, touch, taste, vision, and equilibrium. Sorry, smell, hearing, taste, vision, and equilibrium. All right, types of sensory receptors. Well, they can be classified based on what sort of uh, stimulus they detect. So photoreceptors detect the presence of light, for, good for vision. Mechanoreceptors detect physical change. There's something causing a physical change, a push, a deformation on the receptor. Uh, thermoreceptors, change in temperature, chemoreceptors, the binding of chemicals, so the presence of those chemicals binding to the receptors. And then pain receptors, well, there are lots of ways to stimulate those, so they have uh, a lot of possible stimulus. They end up basically getting defined by what we experience. All right, sensory adaptation. Uh, our brain is receiving a lot of sensory information all the time. And so the brain needs to decide which information is the most important, is what we need to be aware of. And um, so one thing the brain does uh, to um, prioritize information is what's called sensory adaptation. And so what happens is the brain becomes less responsive to a stimulus that is ongoing. Brain basically assumes that when it happened, started happening, you were aware of that, it made you aware of that, and then this thing is continuing to happen, so it must not be as important because we're not doing anything about it. So, for instance, um, if you go to the zoo and you go into uh, near a cage and you smell a lot of um, unpleasant smells from the animals, uh, over time you'll become less and less aware of that unless you try to consciously again be aware of the unpleasant smell. All right, uh, general senses. Again, sensations having to do with the skin, uh, muscles and joints, and, and the organs a little bit. Yeah, the organs as well. So here's a lovely cartoon of the skin. Uh, we have a lot of sensory receptors found in the skin. It's a very sensuous organ detecting many uh, sensations. And a lot of these receptors are also sensory neurons. So if the sensory neuron is acting as a receptor, its uh, ends of it, its free nerve endings, can be that receptor. And so if we're talking about free nerve endings, what part of the neuron is that? 
boop, 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 it's the dendrites. That's right, the dendrites. And um, these are really common uh, types of sensory receptors, very common in the skin and uh, other epithelial tissues. And they can detect things like itch, temperature, pain, um, touch. Then we have the very specific tactile corpuscles. Tactile corpuscles, you have a connective tissue sheath surrounding uh, free nerve endings of one or more neurons. And these are very sensitive to touch. So tactile corpuscles for the touch sensation. They are mechanoreceptors. So when you touch something or something touches you, the pressure on the skin causes the shape of the tactile corpuscle to change. And that is the stimulus. That is the thing that causes the signal. Uh, laminated corpuscles, similar structure. We have connective tissue covering the dendrites of a sensory neuron. Um, tactile corpuscles are a little deeper in the skin, usually, and they detect pressure. So how hard something is touching you. Is it a gentle touch or a very forceful touch? And again, it is a mechanoreceptor, so the uh, pressure on the skin causes a change in shape of the laminated corpuscle. And that is the signal that is detected to cause the nerve impulse to be sent to the central nervous system. All right, temperature, blah, temperature senses. These are free nerve endings that are detecting specific ranges of temperatures. Um, so they're looking for changes in those temperatures. There's two, two main kinds, the warm receptors, which work uh, primarily detect between 25 degrees Celsius and 45 degrees Celsius, and the cold receptors, which go from 10 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius. These are both uh, quick at adapting. So if you reach out and touch something that's a little warm um, and continue holding it because it doesn't hurt you, then um, you become less aware of its warmth. Um, however, if you touch something that has an extreme temperature that's very, very hot or very, very cold, instead of having the temperature sensation, you get a pain sensation. Because again, extreme temperatures can damage our tissues. Brings us to the sense of pain. Pain receptors are found all throughout the body and they are uh, free nerve endings. So sensory neurons with free nerve endings and they can be triggered by tissue damage, by oxygen uh, deprivation, by extreme stimuli. Um, turns out all organs of the body have pain receptors except the brain. The brain does not have any pain receptors. And initially, pain is a good thing. We want to be aware when something's happening that's damaging our body. So pain is, in theory, a good thing. Um, however, pain can become bad when it persists for too long. So when pain cannot be resolved and you're constantly feeling it, that then becomes detrimental to your well-being. Chronic pain is a major health issue. Um, and just something to be aware of. All right, referred pain. Now it turns out when we have an organ that's triggering a pain sensation, that pain sensation does not necessarily localize to where you would think the organ is. Instead, that pain sensation could end up uh, feeling like it's on the surface of your body in a location nowhere near that organ. So, for instance, here's where the liver is. So that makes sense for if the liver or gallbladder is causing pain to feel pain there. But you also could experience liver and gallbladder pain in the um, upper right side of your neck, which doesn't really make as much sense. Uh, probably the most famous example of um, referred pain is the pain someone might experience during a heart attack where they feel a shooting pain along their left arm. So that would be referred pain because obviously our heart isn't in our left arm. All right, the thought behind referred pain is that there's a common nerve pathway. So the uh, sensory neurons carrying information from the heart and sensory nerve endings coming from the skin in the uh, left arm are both uh, being carried in the same nerve. 
that's going to the spinal cord, and that because of that, you can get a, a crossover effect. Again, that doesn't necessarily explain all examples of referred pain, but it is um, our current level of understanding. All right, nerve pain fibers. Those uh, sensations of pain can either be acute or chronic. Uh, acute pain is quick, brief. You touch a, a sharp needle, um, you feel that pain briefly that gets you to pull your hand away, and then the pain mostly recedes, except for some of the lingering pain just because you have an injury. Uh, chronic pain is uh, longer lasting, and it is slower, and it's usually a dull sort of ache, making you aware of the issue. So acute pain, when you first prick your finger, chronic pain after that to kind of remind you that, yeah, you got a boo-boo, you need to fix that. Um, again, chronic pain that is able to be resolved isn't an issue, but when you have chronic pain, especially extremely intense chronic pain lasting over a very long time and can't be resolved, that can be a major health issue. All right, and finally, the pain impulses, when they arrive in the spinal cord, if that's the, where they're going, um, end up arriving initially in the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord. And then the pain impulses get tra travel up the spinal cord to the brain stem and thalamus. So the place that our pain sensations initially go is through the brain stem into the thalamus, again, most sensations travel through the thalamus and then finally arrive in the cerebral cortex. So you go, oh, I now know where it is I'm getting hurt, and the hypothalamus to help with some of the um, responses that our body may take that are not uh, consciously thought about. Uh, regulating pain, well, once the pain reaches the thalamus, you're not aware of that pain. You know that there's something causing pain. But it has to get to the cerebral cortex before you can appreciate how intense it is and exactly where it is, and also what your emotional and motor responses should be. So often children, when they get hurt, they cry. Adults, on the other hand, tend not to cry when you get hurt. I know when I get hurt now, I just get a little angry. Like, why did I fall down? That is just so annoying. And then after that, the brain uh, will release endorphins as a way to control the pain. Because again, we don't want to always feel pain. We just want the pain when it's making us aware of an issue that could be damaging the body. So endorphins help to resolve the pain. That is it for this part of chapter 10.